Hello and good evening from Tel Aviv. And Jerusalem. My name is Yael Patir. I'm the Israel director for J Street, joined by Yehuda Greenfield Gilat from Jerusalem. So you get both cities from Israel this evening and your noon. Um, this is the first of a series of called calls uh, that we call Solutions at 70, where we try to really look for innovative ways um, to work towards the two-state solution and to provide uh, tangible plans for how to, to get there and how to implement uh, a future two-state solution. And there's no better way of opening our series than with an expert who really tried to, to face and not shy away from what people considered one of the most complicated and uh, really perhaps the heart of the conflict, which is the issue of Jerusalem and how to share Jerusalem between uh, Israel and the Palestinians. I will tell you a bit about Yehuda, and then I will pass the microphone to him to share his work along with a presentation that you would see on your screen. Uh, once Yehuda uh, finishes, Yehuda will take about half an hour. Uh, we welcome your questions. You can also send them as he talks, but we will open um, the floor to uh, questions uh, after he finishes the, his presentation. Please send your questions to info at jstreet.org. Um, anything you can uh, think about, and I will present the, the question to you the, again after he finishes the presentation. So let's begin. Yuda Greenfield Gilat is an architect and a planner. He's the co founder of SAYA. Design for Change, and founder of Terra Una Planning. Um, he's a graduate from the Harvard Kennedy School and holds a bachelor degree in architecture from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. Uh, Yuda was born and raised in Jerusalem, a proud Jerusalemite, as he would describe himself. And he really has managed to specialize in the connection between design planning and conflict resolution, a very, very unique uh, and fascinating expertise. He used the, this expertise and a lot of database that he has collected uh, throughout the years uh, to serve as, as an advisor to negotiators. Uh, he worked with Tsipi Livni, he worked with Reuven Rivlin, who is today the Israeli president, and with a lot of NGOs, international bodies, um, as well as uh, uh, American uh, uh, leaders that he will tell you uh, more about. And really, from, from knowing his work, I can tell you that it's the most extensive uh, database for actual peacemaking, how the reality would look uh, post an agreement. Yuda, thank you so much for joining us today. You, would, you, you did a lot of work on various um, issues and on various um, geographical places, as well as um, problems that need to be solved. But today, we've asked you to focus on Jerusalem uh, and on how, how we can create uh, two capitals, or how, how Jerusalem can, could, can be shared. So thank you again for joining us. And, and please, the stage is yours. All right. Uh, hi, pleasure to be here. Um, this is my first time doing this thing, so um, I apologize if uh, I look a bit strange or... I know you're not supposed to open a lecture with an apology, but uh, you'll have to forgive me for this one. Uh, so as Yael said, uh, my name is Yoda Greenfield. I'm an architect. Um, the next slide talks a little bit about SAYA, which is the organization uh, I started together with Karen Lee Barsi and I, uh, my colleague. Um, it's not very interesting, we can go on, but um, actually we should go on to the next slide because um, I'd like to give you a little bit of context about how 
me as an architect, I got involved in this whole issue of conflict resolution. So um, when I was graduating fifth year of the Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology, the architecture school, um, we were supposed to choose uh, which, uh, what will be our, our final project. Um, and in that very, that very year, uh, Israel has launched the, um, probably the biggest construction project, um, which was the, some call it the security fence, some call it the separation wall was very controversial about what we noticed as architects or young architects is that my community, the planning community, has not been taking part of this debate, although architect, although this is a planned object. Um, uh, we were dismissing it as if it belongs to security or to military or to things that are beyond the average uh, architect. And, and we thought that that's um, outrageous. And in the beginning, we, we thought maybe we should create some kind of a project uh, that would kind of protest uh, that our approach to um, protests, I mean, the common approach to um, how architects need to treat issues that are related to territorial conflict. But what happened that year was that the Geneva Initiative, uh, I'm not sure that all of you are aware, uh, aware of the Geneva Initiative, it was a bilateral a non-official agreement between Israelis and Palestinians that presented a very detailed uh, plan of uh, solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It came out that very year. And what that uh, the plan presented is a seam line in Jerusalem that will have a border, but there were no details about how this border will be work, how it's going to be planned, how it's going to work, how it's going to be activated. Um, so we asked ourselves as, as people who are trying, who, first of all, as a Jerusalemite and as people who are invested in making peace, how can we contribute to make this happen? Or in other words, how do we create a solution that will help a peace agreement? Um, so, and our logic was, as you say, it's a ter territorial conflict. We architects are supposed to be people who understand territory and space. Why not try and help? Um, doing that. So our final project was the first project of SIA, um, finding a understanding the border between East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem in a final status arrangement uh, in front of the old city. But since then, a lot of other projects came in. Um, let's continue to the next slide. And maybe to give you a little bit of the sensitivity of why architects are something that might be uh, even necessary in when you're, one is crafting a solution. So here you see in, the, in this picture, probably some of you will recognize Moshe Dayan, uh, the Israeli commander of the, of the forces, uh, the 1948. On the other side, you see Abdallah Atal, who was the commander of the Jordanian. Uh, forces. What they're doing here is actually signing the map, which is the ceasefire uh, ceasefire map um, in Jerusalem. If we get to the next slide, we can see in an old UN map, we can see what was the result of this map. You see the blue line and the green line actually today are what we call the no man's land or the green line. So today in Jerusalem, you can barely Apologize, it seems that Yehuda... Okay. Yehuda? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I apologize. It's probably something to do with the Gaza electricity crisis. Um, can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I don't know where I stopped, um, where, where you stopped hearing me, but I'll say again that what you see in front of you is the, is the U, old UN map that shows the seam line between East and West Jerusalem. And what you can see between those blue and green lines is what we call the no man's land, or what is today the green line. 
And I always wonder if in that room where Abdallah Tal and Moshe Dayan would sign this, um, this sort of agreement, if an architect would sit there or somebody who has sensitivity to space and tell them that every inch on the map is probably a few hundred meters in real life, maybe the peace arrangement would look a bit different than it looked like. If we get to the next slide, we have different examples of, I'd say, territorial arrangements that are involved in some kind of trying to make peace. Um, in Nicosia, you know, the, the city center is all blocked with um, a, a decaying area. We have the area of Jerusalem, the same thing, um, the, what, what we call the, the security fence. Um, Berlin and Belfast are also areas where in some kind of, you know, arrangements created a really harsh uh, physical landscape. And our question is, is this, is this a necessary outcome of every arrangement between people who don't necessarily agree on everything? If we get to the next page, to the next slide, um, you can see that we already have this, um, already this experience in Jerusalem. Um, being conducted poorly, uh, I, have to, uh, I have to admit, although some would argue that security barrier has saved a lot of Israeli lives, it has caused immense damage on both the urban structure of Jerusalem, on the, on the lives of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians. Is, that, is this the only way to create a territorial solution between Israelis and Palestinians? And we would argue that it's not the way. There are other ways that are much better. If we get to the next slide, um, yeah, we can, yeah, the next slide, and then let's go to the next one. We let's discussing how architects or how people like us who are planners, designers who understand the territorial aspect can try to imagine the way a territorial agreement is actually implemented within such a delicate and I'd say sensitive city. So this is what we call resolution planning, which is using tools of planning and design to conflict resolution. Um, the next slide I will go through quickly because it demonstrates two, I'd say, uh, two case studies from the past. One of them is the, actually the 1948 uh, ceasefire agreement between Jordan and Israel. And the second is the Oslo agreement. Both of them demonstrate how poorly the leaders from both sides have really took in account the territorial aspect. Um, but I, I said it before, so I won't say it again. It's really, it's really crucial that somebody who understands space and territory should be part of the discussion. Let's go on to the next slide and start dealing with the issues. So what is basically a territorial solution in Jerusalem? I mean, it's a very complicated issue. I'll try to simplify it for you um, in the next 20 or so minutes. Um, the first issue is basically the big argument regarding open city and a divided city. So people are very much afraid of city because they remind them of Berlin. Um, but on the other hand, what it does say and very clearly is that the Israeli or the, I'd say the Jewish parts of Jerusalem will be Israel and the Palestinian parts of Jerusalem will be Al-Quds, Palestine. Now, the other model that is kind of floating around is the model of the open city, meaning that Jerusalem is somehow is kind of a hub uh, containing both Jewish and uh, Muslim areas, both Palestinian and Israeli areas, with the old city in the center, and somehow this whole thing is conducted jointly between Israelis and Palestinians. So these are the two major models of the of the a solution in Jerusalem. And then uh, once we kind of figure that out, we'll go down to the old city, which is a different, a whole different issue. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, all right. So the next slide comes to the, ne to, the, to, to the conclusion. If we talk about the div divided city model and we go 100% on division, we find it very difficult to go into the old city and cut it into two, uh, to two parts, uh, the Jewish part and the, I'd say, the Israeli part and the Palestinian part. Um, but if we think about an open city as a model, we would find that very hard to implement because in the Jerusalem area, we have about 820,000 820, people. 
are living, and then how they exit and enter this kind of open city model, which is not really open. I mean, the enter the in, the the center is open, but uh, the connection to Israel and Palestine will be some kind of monitored. So this also this model entirely is also not great. And what most I'd say most experts talk about is the hybrid model, meaning that in general, Greater Jerusalem will be divided according to the Clinton parameters. And I'll get to that in a second. And the old city itself will be preserved as a, I'd say, a living museum, as a place which both sides can share. So, and we'll get to all of these issues um, uh, later. But in general, I would say that if people talk about uh, Jerusalem, mostly kind of, I'd say, focused on the, what we call the hybrid model. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Um, and here you see basically the, the, I'd say the basic plan of the Geneva Initiative, which was our first employer, basically. They actually, after we came out of school with our project, they commissioned us to create what we call today the Jerusalem Annex, which is the set of plans and illustrations that demonstrate the solution in Jerusalem. Um, what you see here is basically a puzzle. And what, what, the reason we did that is that it was, at first it was very hard to understand, besides the, the fact that the line is kind of hideous um, and it actually follows the, you can see the blue, the blue parts are the Israeli parts and then the green parts are Palestinian parts. It's very hard to follow the nature of the city, the future city that will be, will be created after a implementation of final status agreement will be you know in in place so the first thing we did we took them apart for a second and then we tried to identify the needs and the nature of the two different cities that would live side by side as you can see the israeli jerusalem city on on my left is kind of a condensed city with some kind of little um, areas that are coming out, Malay Adumim, Pisgat Zev, like little balloons. Um, but it's definitely a city that is concentrated and has a clear connection to the West. On the contrary, the Palestinian city would be, has a very strong north-south e, north orientation from Ramallah through the Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Um, and it has a very different nature the seam line, the area where the old city is, is actually quite different. While in the Jewish Jerusalem, it is on, um, it's kind of, I'd say, the edge of the city. Um, we can very much imagine in the Palestinian side how the old city is basically a, a center because it really has a big mass of urban development above and a big mass of urban development um, beneath it. I mean, in the north and in the south. So the conclusion of it is that those two cities have very different development needs. And one needs to take that into account when he or she are starting to think about implementing a territorial solution. And we'll get to that later. If we get to the next, um, to the next um, slide, and at this point I have to apologize. Some, some of you listening to this presentation probably think that, uh, or probably a sense this is very complicated. And really getting all of it, it wrapped, wrapped up in for, for Yuda, you're breaking out. You're breaking up. Let's see if we can you, refresh you. Can you hear me? Am I back? Yes. Yes, you're back. Okay, I apologize for this. Is the you hear me? Can you hear me for that that you can't hear all of this in in smooth fashion. Um, this is the situation. Um, so these are the major issues of the center, the the major part of Jerusalem. What you see in this map is basically the very center of Jerusalem where the green line is very mostly dominant, where you have a clear definition where Jewish Israeli neighbors, neighborhoods are and where uh, Palestinian, um, mostly Muslim, but some Christian neighborhoods are. And 
this is the area that I'd say would get most of the focus of the, our work because it is the center of the city and it has to be treated in the most, I'd say, sensitive way. And we're going through the issues is what we call the American colony, which is basically, I'd say, the area from the old city north of the city center, um, in, including also Road 60, which is basically the main road that leads uh, from, I'd say, Hebron, Nablus, all the way up to Jenin, um, but goes through Jerusalem on this very, on the green line. Then we have the old city itself, which we need to discuss how, what are the models of so, a solution there. And then there's another neighborhood we call, it, it's named Abu Tor, which is actually the, the only neighborhood in Jerusalem today that it's actually mixed, which is, I'd say, Israeli-Palestinian. I mean, we have some Palestinians living in, in, in the French Hill, uh, in some other neighborhoods, but a mixed neighborhood that needs, I'd say, a solution for the neighborhood itself um, is only Abu Tor. So if we go to the next slide, we can see that um, this, is the, so this is what is, what is what you see is uh, lighted up with red is the area I just talked about, the city center. You can see around it is a lot of, uh, of neighborhoods that are actually quite remote from the center. What you see in blue is actually the area that Olmert, can you see me? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah? Am I good? Hello? Hmm. So we'll continue. Um, so what you see here is the, basically the proposal of Olmert, Eud Olmert in 2008. Um, the area, you can see very well the green line, which all of this includes the areas that are within the Israel. And then what you see in blue, light blue and dark blue, are the areas that uh, Olmert wanted to annex to Israel um, in a final status agreement. So um, what we're concentrating on is the city center. It's not the areas in the north or the south. because They are a bit, a bit easier to solve. What is most difficult to solve is actually the division in the middle of the city. So that's why we focus on that. We continue to the next slide. Um, we can start with the first issue. Um, which is, I'd say, Road 60 itself. Road 60 is a very important road. You can see it leads from the old city up to, um, to, um, to well, actually up to Jenin. It's a, it's a, it's a very um, important road, um, and it's actually a very important municipal road within Jerusalem. And as you can see, uh, the red line is what the Geneva Initiative suggested would be the border. And as you can see, it's situated directly on the green line. So the question is, if we go and we start focusing about a resolution of a human scale, who gets the road? I mean, the Israelis would say, we have paved this road. We have a light rail system on it. It's an important road for us, and we will have it. And then the Palestinians would say, we need one big road to lead us from Ramallah to the old city. We have no boulevards. We have no, we are really don't have a, a network of, of, of streets. So this needs to be our road. And actually both of them will have a point. Um, we, when we thought about this idea, we discussed, uh, you know, we discussed a few options. And then if we get to the next slide, we came to the conclusion that actually the road is wide enough to actually create a binational road, meaning dividing it, taking a road that's actually, a, uh, you know, a series of X, uh, junctions and create a series of T junctions with a border in in the middle. If we get to the next slide, we can see um, more or less how we imagine it. Um, the Israeli side is here in kind of grayish bluish, and the Palestinian side is in greenish, and the border is actually right in the middle of the road. Um, now, um, a lot of people. Um, is it, can you hear me? Is it okay? I mean, I'm, I'm getting some, I'm good, right? We can yeah. hear you, okay. yes. So let's go. Okay, great. Um, so, um, 
at, at first, people that see this image are shocked and actually kind of frightened because it's really, it could go very wrong from here. I mean, we can imagine a, you know, I'd say an eight meter concrete wall in the middle. Um, and then we're actually the very place we were, um, you know, 50 years ago. Or we can other, you know, we have other case studies in the world that show that this is not really a good, good idea. Um, so the next layer is how do we, I mean, okay, we have an idea. How do we start thinking about it in a more constructive way? So what we thought about doing is uh, here you see what we call um, a section, meaning it's a kind of a, we cut through the road and you can see the different, um, uh, the, th the, the different uh, functions of, of the road. On the left, you can see the Palestinian sides using uh, both uh, public transportation and private transportation. In the middle in red, you see the border function that contains different attributes. And then you have, on the Israeli side, you have the light rail system and then private uh, transportation as well. And our focus was to create something in the middle that actually does not intimidate you too much. It, it, it is a security facility but it needs to find a way not to, be, not to be presented at a security facility and can be kind of blended within the city landscape. We get to the next, um, to the next uh, slide. Um, this is a very, I'd say, initial design of how it looks like. Now, I, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's, you know, it's a beautiful design. What I would say, it tries to translate um, security needs into, I'd say, some kind of urban, we call it urban furniture, meaning it's things that you find in urban settings and they are, they seem to you normal. So this thing really can't be crossed because there are sensors and there's a little bit of, there's a gap between the sidewalk and the, um, and, and the border itself and there's an obstacle that you really can't cross. But it does not necessarily look like something you can recognize from the, you know, from, I'd say, a, a whatever, a prison or a border. Um, let's go on to the next slide. And it has, of course, all of the security demands. I mean, we're not security experts. We sat with security experts uh, that have approved uh, our designs. If you get to the next slide. Um, what I think that, oh, yeah, I, I, I will say something about it, but maybe later on the next, after you see the next, uh, the next issue, which is crossing the American colony, let's go to the next slide. And what you can see here is basically on that same road, road 60, we wanted to design a crossing facility that would enable people to cross from side to side. Um, if we get to the next slide, so again, you can see the very spot that we shown yesterday uh, before, and that seemed to us a very a good spot to enable uh, mostly mostly uh, labor from the Palestinian side to cross to into the Israeli side. Um, the next slide will demonstrate how um, we yeah here you can see a plan, um, which what it tried to do is basically think about what is the Palestinian city will need in the future and what the Israeli uh, um, city will need in the future, and then trying to design them together with a crossing facility. So on the Palestinian side, which is on, on your right, there is actually a community center because there's a severe lack of, I'd say, public institutions in East Jerusalem. And on top of it, we designed a, a facility that could be used as a crossing facility, but also could be cha use, uh, change its use very easily. The crossing actually takes place on a bridge that crosses to the other side, and then it's a public park because the Jewish neighborhood of Mashiarim and Azat uh, Israel uh, on the other side is actually very crowded and has no open spaces whatsoever. So this is what we designed there. If we go to the next, um, to the next uh, image, so here you see kind of a render of it. Um, the green side again is the Palestinian side. The blue side, the blue shaded area is the Israeli side. And you can imagine easily how a Palestinian um, would come to this area, cross through the facility, cross the bridge, and then um, get onto the, to the public transportation and go on to his or her 
uh, daily work. Um, this actually, we're quite proud of this solution because um, once uh, when Ormelt and Abu Mazen were discussing their, I'd say, round of failed negotiations in 2008, um, this very image was presented to Abu Mazen by Ormelt as his vision of how a border can work in the city center. Um, and we're actually quite proud of it because this is the very goal we were uh, aiming for, is to implement ideas in the, not to implement the idea of reaching peace because that, that was already there, but trying to make uh, things that are very scary and kind of amorphic, uh, putting them into a context of a city and creating better design that way. So we feel that, um, uh, unfortunately, um, these negotiations went nowhere, uh, but we were able to contribute to the level of thinking of the person who was in charge. Um, and if, you know, if you, you would ask me how, why the role of architects in conflict resolution is helpful, I would say, I would give you this example and say there, we, 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 did, we did hear a few things. First of all, we created a solution that translated a very scary notion of a border into something that people understand on a very daily basis in an urban life. This is a busy road, um, many vehicles and public transportation on it. People know that they don't cross it. They feel comfortable with the notion that it's not a very crossable road. So implementing, their, uh, 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 implementing it on that spot a, a barrier that also from a territorial uh, aspect does not allow you to cross is not as intimidating. It kind of, you know, in a sense, it kind of is, soothes a little bit of the tension around the concept of a border. So this is the first thing. The second thing is that we were able to uh, demonstrate to people who feel about the idea of division Jerusalem in a very uh, scared, I mean, they get scared, that things can be different. If you, if you put an effort in being imagine, uh, you know, imaginative and creative about how things can work, things can look a little bit different. And then the idea is not to present this as a final design, but as a, a I'd say, a uh, invitation for creative minds to think about these issues in a more creative way. So I, I think, and, and, and finally, as I said, the fact that people, that Olmet has used it as a basis for his vision means that was able to reach out to people who don't have necessarily a background in planning and give them an idea, a better idea of what they want to do. And, and in, in that, um, we feel that we kind of, we were able to fulfill what we we're looking for. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, yeah, so here you see Olmelt um, and Abu Mazen. Yeah, it's, it's a shame that um, things have uh, unfolded as they have. Uh, let's move on to the next issue um, because we Let have only just, uh, Yuda, remind everybody that if you have questions, please send them to info at jstreet.org. Thank okay. Have you heard that? I mean, if you haven't heard it, send questions to info at jstreet.org, right? Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, next slide. We, we, can, we can skip this. This is uh, less in, in, important. Uh, yeah, skip this too. There's a, there are a lot of slides on this. Um, let's go to the old city because this is really an important part. The old city itself, again, there's a debate what we want to do with it. Um, as I said in the beginning, there is, a there is a common knowledge that the old city itself cannot be divided because of, its, because of the, na the nature of its urban density. Um, so luckily enough, we have a, a wall surrounding it, a historical wall, that creates actually a very comfortable setting for one special regime, which could be contain different, you know, different settings of understanding but it, is, it could be managed physically as a special regime. If we go to the next slide, um, um, yeah, well, I said that, no clear division line. You can see the different, I'd say, relations of Christian, uh, different sites that are holy to diff you know, different religions. Um, as you can see, they're actually quite all over the place. So it's another reason why we would like to see the old city not as a divided entity, but actually as some big living um, museum or terminal. If you, get to the, if you go to the next slide, um, 
this is, I mean, if we approach the old city itself as, as, as I said, as one living museum, there are two models that can work. One, option A is actually that I'd say an Israeli comes in from Jaffa Gate or any other Israeli gate and then walks all around, not, not, in a, not in, on this half, it's kind of misleading, all over the place, and then goes back through a, one of the Israeli gates, and then the Palestinian does the same. Or it's actually a big crossing facility, meaning that you show your passport in Jaffa Gate, uh, that's option B, and then you can leave into Palestine through St. Seven Gate. The, these are two major options. If you get to the next slide, the major challenge would probably be the gates. So if the, in, in, if the inside is actually quite free, I mean, there are some kind of security arrangements, but it's free, the main challenge is how do we treat the gates? So if you get to the next, yeah, we can get, just go to the next slide. Yeah, I know this slide is a kind of small. What we, what we offered and we proposed, we said we don't want to touch, the, actually, the, we don't want to touch the gates because the gates are, are uh, unique and we don't want to create any, any kind of monitoring facilities within them. So what we proposed in, in, those, in the cases of the gates is to actually remove or take a distance from the gates and create the monitoring facilities, which would be required in order to enter and exit the old city, uh, to areas that are, uh, are near, but don't sabotage the historical, I'd say, facade of the city. So in the Jaffa Gate, whoever has been, uh, had been able to visit Jerusalem, we have the Mamila compound, which is a big uh, prominent of shops. And actually, we took the, the, I'd say, a third of it to create a, a really big functioning crossing facility in and out of the old city. And the Dung Gate, which is actually a smaller gate near the western wall, we found an area that in, in which you can implement um, a crossing facility. If we go to the next slide, another, another proposal, uh, another uh, option we had is to use this, you see down, this really neglected area under the plaza that enters the, the Jaffa Gate, which is actually uh, has some unique archaeological remains and create a museum out of it. If we get to the next slide, I can show you what we were proposing. Um, taking the very, the very spot and creating a museum with a glass floor, which actually does function as a crossing facility, but one day when we don't need it anymore, it, re it just functions as a museum. Um, uh, the next slide shows the internal um, design of it. Um, how it's actually how it works, where you come in from, where you go out from, and etc. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, yeah, it's just another um, demonstration of it. So this is, I'd say, the case if we want to treat the old city itself as a um, you know as a special regime. But the fact is that a lot of I'd say uh, Jewish, I'd say important sites for for Jewish heritage are actually outside of the old city. If you see number five, uh, that's um, the Kidron Valley. Number six uh, on the map is the old cemetery of, uh, of Har HaZaytim, the Mount of Olives. It's the biggest and oldest cemetery, Jewish cemetery in the world. Um, number four is the city of David. All of these are issues, are, are places that have a significant to um, Jewish, I'd say, cultural heritage. And what do you do with these? So uh, uh, the whole project, was dedicated, if you go on to the next slide, um, to figuring out what we call the historic basin, meaning that even if you don't divide um, these areas, you can actually implement a special regime on them. So they could be part of the territorial, one territorial side, either Israel and Palestine, but they could be declared as a special regime, meaning that they're functioning as, you know, the territory uh, around, um, you know, a territory of a, I'd say, an embassy, for instance, which is a special arrangement, which it's, it's uh, considered part of the, of the country that, that is uh, currently uh, occupying the, the embassy. So the same thing can happen here. The historical basin could function as special, uh, a special what we call special arrangements, and be connected to the special regime of the old city. I won't get into all of the details because really we don't have the time, but the, 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 the challenge here was defining an historic basin that is, not, that is as minimum as possible. Um, and yeah, so th this was this project. If you go on 
to to the next and and really I have to I think I have to wrap up in order to get some questions right Yael? Um, take a few so more minutes. yeah okay so yeah this is another uh, demonstration of of the spit of the historic basin we can go on to the next slide um, we can go quickly now um, one 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 more thing I want to show you yeah let's just go and I'll tell you to stop. Um, here, not this, yeah, this here. We can stop here for a second. Um, no, go down a little bit. Yes, this one. All right, so this is the, the neighborhood of Abuto. And as I said, it's a mixed neighborhood. You see the, the blue houses, the blue, the blue buildings are uh, Israeli. The green are Palestinian. The major seam line is the Asael Street, which used to be the seam line in 1960, in a, until 1967. And um, we were trying to figure out where would be the best place to put the border in a very in a, in a dense neighborhood. So the whole project of Abu To, if you go down another uh, another slide, really tries to figure out how do you implement a border that not only um, divides but also is a set of connections. We were trying we developed what we call border gardens, which are mutual spaces that enable both sides to use um, either mutually or you know, by different arrangements. Um, we try to, to connect this, the whole border feature to uh, urban activities, making it um, not an edge, uh, I'd say a borderland at the edge, but something that people will be attracted to come to and visit. Uh, if you go to the next um, slide. Um, here you can see what we designed a promenade with different sites and different things that can happen on the side. Um, definitely that was, yeah, so here we got to the end of the presentation. That's great. Um, so yeah, open to questions. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And, uh, and this is just really the tip of the, of the ice. Um, I'll, I'll open with, with two questions perhaps and encourage people to continue sending their questions to info at j3.org. Um, I, I, I would assume that a, a question that is on uh, people's mind is that, you know, you've, you've presented your work to Prime Minister Olmel during the Annapolis negotiations. You've presented your work to Martin Indyk during the Kerry uh, process uh, um, just recently. And, and perhaps uh, something that I, I missed mentioning in, in the opening when I, when I presented you is that you also ran for city council. And uh, this August, this coming August, you're going to be um, sitting on the, on the Jerusalem uh, council as yeah. a council member. Yeah. So you're, the, the question of practicality and the question of the reaction of the decision makers, I'm sure, is on everybody's mind. Um, so, so let, let me let me divide it and ask you, what do, what are the kind of reactions that you get from people that are close to the negotiating table? Um, and what are the the reactions that you you would get from, let's say, people that sit with you would would be sitting with you, and count uh, on the, you know. Yeah. Chairs of the of yeah. Jerusalem uh, Council, and then I have another question. So let's start with that. Okay, uh, it's actually a good question because it relates. It, it really asks, how does this, uh, I'd say, uh, um, storytelling, this uh, imaginative work, uh, how does it uh, basically integrate into the everyday life? So. Honestly, it's a, it's a challenging issue because uh, policymakers uh, tend to avoid very hard questions until the very last minute. So, can you hear me? Am I good? Okay, to the yes. very last minute. So, most politicians that I encountered, and I think I met with, I'd say, uh, a third of the politicians who are actually in error in, I'd say. Uh, influential areas today uh, in this way or another in the past decade um, tend to not even think about the issues here assuming 
that these will be solved once the major grand picture is is delineated, uh, which I think is a very it's it's a very problematic approach. But it's a tendency of politicians not to treat not to get into areas that they really can um, give a they cannot come out good at. You know, um, there's no way there's no good way out of talking about the dividing Jerusalem. So in that sense, um, once people do listen. They are amazed, and I remember that reaction from Martin Indyk in, uh, very clearly. Um, they were amazed of the amount of work that has been done and the level of the details figured out on the plan. Um, but I would say that uh, it's, it's, it's hard to get their attention on the details, on, on such specific details, because most, I'd say, most politicians and leaders thinking you know in bullet points and they want to get them first um rarely you have someone who understands the the requirement of understanding the details before uh um or in parallel to getting the big picture now in the sense of city council i would say that today jerusalem the vision of jerusalem is a complete i'd say denied issue in the jerusalem municipal politics for various reasons first of all the municipal issue in Jerusalem has nothing to do with the grand solution of a division or not. It's this, the, the issue of Jerusalem as part of the final status agreement is part of the, I'd say, the prime minister's office, if at all. It's part of the grand strategy of Jerusalem, of, of Israel. The everyday life of Jerusalemites, both in the East and the West, have to be treated today as part of our work. So these issues are not really discussed, although the, I'd say the, the division between East and West in Jerusalem is quite clear uh, in infrastructure and in employment and, you know, in, in um, every aspect of urban life, you can clearly see the difference, but it's not really discussed. And it's not an issue that is part of, I'd say, my everyday activities. But, but when urban planning does occur in Jerusalem, there is no uh, taken, it, it's not taken into consideration. No. Future. Correct. That's, okay. Today, the official approach, the official approach is that Jerusalem needs to be developed everywhere. In fact, you will see that Jerusalem is not developed everywhere. You could see that in East Jerusalem, it's much harder to get a permit. Some areas in the municipal area of Jerusalem, but beyond the, the security barrier, are not under municipality um, um, authority at all. They're just no man's land. Um, so things are very different. I mean, the reality on the ground is very different from the, I'd say, bombastic uh, declarations of the mayor and prime minister and, you know, the government. It's very different. I have a question from um, Bruce, who is asking, um, the maps show area like Malay Adumim, connected to the Israeli side by tentacles that divide the, the Palestinian city. Is he seeing it right? Yes, it's a good point, uh, Bruce. Um, the... Uh, the, the fact, what we call facts on the ground, meaning the settlements that were developed, but are big enough uh, that create actually no sense of not connecting them to Israel or Palestine on, this, on, on that matter, are going to be connected on kind of very thin strings or tentacles, as you call it, to, the, to, the, to Israel or Palestine. Now, it's not a great solution. And it, it could be solved by creating either uh, passageways that are above the ground, they could be under the ground, or they could be on the ground but not really creating a division within territorial, um, I'd say, continuity. But in every, in every uh, I'd say, in every uh, issue where this kind of tentacles involved, we took major concern or major focus to make sure that the territorial continuity is not jeopardized. But definitely it's part of what needs to be solved.
Can you hear me? Yes. Um, another question is your work is um, you've you've started the creating these maps into solutions in 2003, correct? Yeah. So throughout the, the, the um, this period, have, ha, have, has there been a significant change in the ability to implement this, uh, such plans? That's a very good question. I would argue that not really. I mean, Jerusalem has evolved. Um, more areas, I mean, a lot of units were, bu were built. Um, there, there are areas that some would argue that prevent the ability to reach a division between the sides, which is the main concern. Saying so not that there are more houses, but if you build them in strategic areas, that's supposed to be able to enable you to divide the two cities. Um, some would argue that it's more difficult today than it used to be. I would say that not significantly, meaning that the, the, um, the general structure of Jerusalem is so clearly homogeneous, meaning that Israeli Jewish neighborhoods are Jewish and Israeli and Palestinian Muslim neighborhoods are, 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 are Palestinian, that really the major Clinton parameters, meaning that this would be that and this would be that, still are really valid. Uh, there are some areas that have become more sensitive and more problematic, but the problem is symbolic rather than, uh, I'd say, spatial. Or it's not a planning issue, it's a diplomatic issue. We have a question from Chaya who's um, asking whether there's any joint Israeli-Palestinian initiatives currently to deal with, uh, with uh, planning groups of architects or planners. Um, perhaps there's a connection to Emek Shave, a group of uh, archaeologists. And while probably she thought about Emek Shave, she also asks, how, how does archaeology complicate your work? Well, first of all, um, there, there probably are some, some, there is some work going on. Um, I'm a part of what we call the X group, which is a bun, it's, it's actually a group of, of, of um, economists, not planners. Um, but I, I'm a Israeli I'm a planner Palestinian and international. It's Israeli Palestinian. Uh, yeah, mostly Israeli and Palestinian, some internationals as well. Uh, we, we recently, um, put out for the World Bank a big project on Gaza and the Jordan Valley. Um, but I have to say that in, you know, in comparison to 10 years ago, uh, the amount of, of, I'd say, joint groups is really, really uh, much lower. That, excuse me, that's because of the issue of normalization. And as you know, the conflict grows, um, it, it becomes more complicated. Um, regarding Emek Shave, uh, they're they're doing they're doing a very important job. Um, I I think that I mean I want to relate to the question if archaeology archaeology kind of complicates things. Definitely, archaeology is used and actually everywhere, not only in here, to for political reasons. I mean, it is not only to discover our heritage, but to dominate our heritage and and create the I'd say the sense that uh, we have a bigger and a, and, a, and a better argument about these territories. For instance, main, the main area where this is an issue is the city of David, where actually quite astonishing remains uh, uh, of, of, I'd say, uh, Hebrew, of Hebrew existence are, are, were discovered. And actually it puts us in a real challenge because um, these are real important artifacts for Israelis and Jews. And they happen to be in the middle of a Palestinian, I'd say, very dense neighborhood. So what do you do about it? I mean, we have to, we have to treat it not only as sheer political, uh, I'd say cold-blooded political strategy, but really the development of more, more complex layers of identity, which we have to take into account when we want to get and reach a real sustainable solution. So I know it's not a very good answer. I'm saying that it does complicate life. 
But on the contrary, it also gives a lot of meaning because once Ir David is, is, is considered an asset for Israelis, it could be you know, traded off or bargained to some er other area that could be part of a deal. So it, I'd say it, it enlarges the pie in a way. Which, so which this is leads also an optimistic the, look about it. Yuda, which leads to the uh, next and final question from Nancy. Um, Il David is a, obviously a, a tourist uh, site that was developed within a Palestinian neighborhood called Silwan. And Nancy is asking, how is, how is the SIA uh, plan that we, are, we just uh, looked at uh, received by Palestinians? So, um, I, so I, I didn't mention it, but um, a lot of our work was done as together in cooperation with Palestinian architects. Uh, the Jerusalem Annex of the Geneva Initiative was all designed by the Israeli and Palestinian architects altogether. And we have collaborated on various other projects as well with Palestinian uh, architects. So a lot of what you see here is, I'd say, in some sense, agreed upon. It's not something that we as Israelis inflict on the Palestinians. Um, I would say that lately, in the past, I'd say, four or five years, I'm more concentrated on designing the Israeli perspective rather than getting to a consensus with the Palestinians because I think that both sides have the responsibility to get their people in line with what, needs, what is required to get to a deal. So it's not only a matter of a joint venture, it's a matter of educating your people. So, it's, um, so in general, we do have, and, and we will always have people who object what we do, either Israelis and Palestinians. So you always find it controversial. So, but, but, but in general, a lot of our work was designed in an effort to, uh, to move through a consensus. Great. Yuda, uh, on behalf of JStreet and all the people that join us, the, joined us now and the people that will probably uh, watch the video in the future, um, I really want to thank you for mm -hmm. taking uh, the time and presenting your work and for doing the work. Uh, and uh, and really uh, uh, to share with everybody that uh, if you have any questions about how to um, divide, uh, move people from one place, relocate, uh, uh, what to do with settlements, a lot of questions that have uh, that which uh, answers have to do with planning. Uh, Yehuda is the person that has the, the answers and, and will for sure find opportunities to hear more from you in the future. Um, so for now, thank you very much. And I hope that those of you that um, were with us uh, this time will join us for the uh, future calls in our series. Good night and have a nice day. Bye-bye.